Hello YouTube, today my guide will be on lighting. It will cover the more technical aspects of lighting and this will not be a simple buying guide. So you guys have been warned. This will probably be a multi-part series due to the amount of content that has to be covered. And this video is focused on lighting basics. These are the three main questions that I'll cover. Firstly, what part of the light spectrum do plants use for photosynthesis? Next, I'll talk about do lighting fixtures actually produce different light? Then putting the first two questions together, we get methods to measure light quality or output from a light fixture. In the entire electromagnetic spectrum, plants only use the narrow band of visible light for photosynthesis. Plants cannot use ultraviolet light or infrared light for photosynthesis. Only light that is visible to the human eyes is used by plants for photosynthesis. The next question is, are all parts of the visible light spectrum equal for photosynthesis? There have been a number of scientific studies done on this. Let's start with the wrong chart first. Many sites and forums that claim to be well researched in this topic will pull up this chart. It is a chart of chlorophyll A and B's absorption spectra. It shows that chlorophyll A and B absorbs blue and red light strongly but reflects green light almost entirely. From this chart, it seems like green light is totally not used by the plant for photosynthesis. However, these results are only valid for chlorophyll extracts in a lab setting environment and does not reflect the full complexities of a living leaf. Therefore, the absorption spectra of chlorophyll under lab settings is not a good proxy for actual photosynthesis. Failing to understand this point has led many sites to make wild claims that green light is not used at all in photosynthesis and that lights that are heavy in the green spectrum are useless for growing plants. Pigments in the leaf behave quite differently from those in the test tube. In the leaf, the probability of a pigment absorbing light depends on various factors such as the specific protein that the pigment is bound to, the orientation of the pigment protein complex, as well as other forces exerted by the surrounding medium on the pigment protein complex. Green light is absorbed deeper in the leaf structure. About 70% of green light is actually absorbed by the leaf and only 30% is reflected. And this 30% gives us the characteristic green tint of green leaves. Most of the scientific community is in agreement on this and only hobbies uh, get it wrong by interpreting the wrong charts. There is very strong scientific research to back up the idea that plants do use green light for photosynthesis and in some circumstances even more effectively than let's say red light. This is the actual accurate chart that describes the wavelength that drives photosynthesis. This is the McCree curve of 1972 published a long time ago in a paper that wanted to discover what is the action spectra for photosynthesis. This chart shows the efficiency or quantum yield of CO2 assimilation as a function of wavelength. For example, at 600 nanometers, for every one unit of light, there is one unit of CO2 being assimilated. However, at 500 nanometers, for every one unit of light, only 0.7 units of CO2 is assimilated. From this chart, we can read that red light drives photosynthesis most efficiently, followed by blue light, and lastly by green. However, the differences is not as large. One must also take into account that red light is most strongly absorbed by water compared to green and blue light. And the deeper your tank, the more of it you are lose. This chart shows how spectrum shifts as the water gets deeper. Initially red heavy, the light becomes blue heavy as the water gets deeper and deeper. So, taking all factors into consideration, while red and blue light does drive photosynthesis more strongly than green light, and this is what NASA uses to grow letters in space. As far as hobbies are concerned, plants use all parts of the visible light spectrum. There are also greater factors at play, such as aesthetics. I mean, we won't want a tank looking as purple, even if it means growing plants maybe 10% faster. Since photosynthesis drops off rapidly below 400 nanometers and above 700 nanometers, we describe the region between 400 and 700 nanometers as PAR or photosynthetically active radiation. This is also the range that PAR meters traditionally measure. I will talk more on how to measure this with regards to light fixtures later. 
The next question I want to address is, is there such thing as light quality? If we take two fixtures, for example, a metal halide fixture versus a fluorescent desk lamp, can we tell the difference between light that each of the fixture produces? Keep in mind that the speed of light is constant, and this is true for all light. And the only thing that differentiates blue versus red light, for example, is that blue is of a shorter wavelength, and that is what gives it more energy. Light is uniform otherwise. If we have two fixtures producing exactly the same spectrum of light, then in terms of quality, the light is identical. Of course, in reality, spectrum differs greatly across different fixtures. When we say that a metal halide is a stronger light compared to a fluorescent desk lamp, what we mean is that a metal halide produces a larger number of photons compared to the fluorescent lamp. The photons of light produced by the metal halide travel at exactly the same speed as the photons of light produced by the fluorescent desk lamp. So in that sense, there's no such thing as a stronger light. What a stronger light is, is a lamp that has more blue in the spectrum, which gives it greater penetrative power than a lamp that has more red. Fixtures also differ in how spread out or how focused their light or beam is, and fixtures that have a more focused beam will prevent less light from spilling out into the surroundings and it will have greater penetrative power as well. To this end, all lights are equal as in no fixture by produces better light by default. It all depends on the spectrum of the exact lamp, the number of photons produced, the spread as well as the efficiency of the lamp. The next topic I want to talk about is K rating. So for example, when people say use a 6500K light, what does it mean? The first thing to know is that K rating has absolutely nothing to do with how strong the light is. Rather, it is a numerical indicator of the visual hue of the light. To understand this, I have to introduce you to the CIE chromaticity diagram. The, the diagram includes all colors perceivable by normal human vision, and it takes into account the max saturation of that color. Accordingly, because our eyes are more sensitive to green than the other colors, green has a bigger area and a higher max saturation possible. For our purposes, it will be enough to understand that this diagram shows all colors perceivable by normal human vision. The white line in the center of this diagram is called the Planckian locus. It shows the color of an incandescent black body radiator at different temperatures. For example, stars are approximate black body radiators. Our sun at 5700 Kelvin will have a whitish color when plotted on the Planckian locus scale. And this is the color of our daylight. The brighter star from the constellation Orion, for example, Rigel, has a surface temperature of 12,000 K. While plotted on the Planckian locus, it looks blue with a Kelvin rating of 12,000. In short, this is what K rating is. It indicates a color hue on the Planckian locus, nothing more, nothing less. The Planckian locus is only for black body radiators. Obviously, when your fluorescent lamp has a 6,500 Kelvin rating, it doesn't mean that the temperature of the light is 6,500. What it does mean is that it has the same color hue as an actual black body radiator which is heated to 6500 Kelvin. Not all colors are represented directly on the Planckian locus. If we have a purple bulb whose actual hue is represented by point C on this chart, we take the closest point on the Planckian locus, and which is 6000K, and we label the bulb 6000K, even though it is a purple bulb. In this sense, K rating actually spreads across a very large range, and just by K rating alone, you can't tell the spectrum of the bulb. You can't tell how strong it is or how well it will grow plants. The only thing you can tell is that roughly which area of the CIE diagram does its visual hue lie at. Now, to recap our original questions, what part of the light spectrum do plants use? Plants use all light between 400 to 700 nanometers, that is the visible light spectrum. Although green is less efficient than red and blue for photosynthesis. This also varies from plant to plant, and plants also adapt their pigments for the light given, so it is not written in stone. Next question, do different fixtures produce different light? What is K rating? And the answer is light is uniform, and the K rating is just a color hue. 
whether or not it is a good fixture depends on the spectrum efficiency, uh, the amount of photons produced, whether it has the spread you want, uh, whether or not it has the color hue that renders your plants in a nice manner. These are the factors that determine whether a light fixture is good or not. The last question, how do we measure how well does a fixture grow plants? Does light quality matter? Does the spectrum of the light produce matter? As far as vegetative growth is concerned, the answer is that, generally speaking, spectrum does not matter. The quantity of light matters, not the quality. Enough of any form of light will grow plants well. We will see some interesting examples in the next couple of slides. As a general principle then, we can measure a light fixture's ability to stimulate plant photosynthesis by its power value. The power value measures all photons emitted between 400 and 700 nanometers. Depending on the power value that hits a substrate, hobbies divide the tanks into different categories uh, given different light ranges. So for example, low light tanks would have less than 30 power. This also begs the question, how much power is really necessary to grow plants? Is higher light always better? Most of you guys will have seen pictures of ADA planted tanks taken straight from their gallery in Niigata. This gallery is open to the public and you can see a photo of it uh, in this slide. It contains dozens of beautiful planted tanks with a huge variety of plants. Tomba had a chance to visit the gallery some years back and he brought a power meter with him. He tested power at the substrate level for several of the tanks in front of a live audience and what he discovered was that most of the tanks had pretty low lighting about in the ranges between 30 to 40 moles of light at the substrate. Despite these relatively low levels of lighting, carpeting plants like Glosso and HC still spread very well. Collectively, the tanks in the gallery provided a tremendous demonstration that one does not need a huge amount of light to grow a beautifully planted tank, as long as your other variables such as CO2 as well as nutrients and upkeeping is up to standard. What's more is that many of the tanks in this gallery were grown using the green spectrum heavy ADA metal halide bulbs. These bulbs were heavier in the green spectrum to make the greens pop more in their tanks. This is no surprise however, for most of the people using uh, commercially available fluorescent lamps in their tanks ranging between 5000K and 6500K, the lights will contain a significant portion of green light in their spectrum. This is because commercial lights are made to seem bright to our eyes and our eyes are more sensitive to green than blue or red. So most commercial lights will contain a fair bit of green by default. With that conclusion, I come to the end of this lighting video and I hope that you have enjoyed it. Um, I will probably produce more videos on choosing specific fixtures as well as delving deeper into how to choose a good spectrum for your planted tank. With that, that's the end of my video. Thanks for watching guys.